Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State University. My um, PhD is in a field called organizational behavior. It's about how people uh, um, work, uh, live within varied kinds of organizations. Um, it focuses on how do we have fun? How do we be productive? How do we really have impact and influence uh, our peers, our bosses, customers, and so on? So that's, and so I, I teach a lot of courses around that, do a lot of consulting. I spent 38 years before industry um, in consulting, working for uh, a couple of major American consulting houses, and also for a couple of Dow 30 companies, Honeywell, uh, Fortune uh, 500 company, United Airlines, and Battelle, uh, which is a $10 billion government contractor that develops technology for the CIA and for the FBI and Homeland Security. So that's just a kind of a quick snippet. I'm also a father, a dad of uh, three sons. Uh, they're all with me as college students at OSU. One of them is in, uh, is actually in my school within the university. We have 18 at Ohio State University where there's 63,000 students. Uh, we have 18 different colleges and schools within that university. One of those 18 colleges is the Fisher College of Business. And I have one of my three sons that's actually there. And before he started, I asked him, you know, we're going to run into each other in the hallways. Do you want to ignore me? Or is it okay if I say hello to you? <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, dad, that's okay. It's cool. We're cool. You can say hello. Uh, you know, uh, anyway, enough on me. Uh, and so, uh, Ralph, is this was this good enough in terms? No, of you're good. You're great. No, this is perfect. So, uh, if you could just tell the kids a little bit about your your background as far as how you got into business and some of the things you were interested in as a high schooler, as as far as like sure. academics. Yep. Well, I, to be brutally honest, I was not probably not as academically inclined as you are. Uh, so I, I like gym and recess and uh, you know, maybe history. Um, and I, um, but I really loved um, like very active things. So between ages of 12 and 16, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something that would be big and important. Uh, I wanted to be a boss, but I didn't know what I wanted to be a boss of. Um, and so I started out by delivering newspapers. I um, started a, um, I did a little bit of uh, babysitting. I didn't like that. So I, I got into pet sitting and I love pet sitting and started to, a, a dog walking service and uh, started to make some real money doing that. Uh, and then uh, um, I also uh, did, did uh, newspapers and a lawn and landscaping business. And so part of what I'm saying here is that from trying out different things when I was young, it gave me some good internal uh, sense of what I like and what I didn't like. And I would suggest that for all of you as well, that the more you can try different things out. So you may not like uh, like to do lawn work, yard work, you know, uh, but uh, you might like to do babysitting work, or you might like, you know, so listen to yourself in terms of, or you might like to do think work, you know, like uh, being able to write an article for your high school, uh, for a high school club, or for, you know, whatever. So uh, really be attentive to that. Now, I, I was a late bloomer on the academic side. So I ended up, I went to several major universities. I went to Harvard University. I went to uh, uh, Case Western Reserve University. I got multiple degrees and so on. But part of this whole journey of working 38 years in industry and consulting, and then now seven years as a PhD doctoral uh, professor in uh, business school, is that um, you know you're being open and attentive to what you what you like to do and what you're good at, and if you make decisions based on that, then 
other good things will happen. Okay. So you'll, uh, you'll find that not only do you, because you're making choices around what you like, um, you're going to get better and you'll probably get more money. You'll probably get more opportunities. Uh, people will appreciate you more because you have more things to offer and you're more authentic and you're real. And so though that's a decision-making criteria you probably want to keep in mind uh, as, as you go forward. So Ralph, I hope that was- yeah, Absolutely, no, you're good. Um, so I'm starting to get some students uh, messaging uh, questions in the chat as well as emailing me. Do you mind if we just jump right into a couple of those? Absolutely. So one of the kids wanted to know, do you find that it's more important to follow your passions or follow the money? Second question, is there a way to find something in between? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, so I, I think passion over money every time, every time. And if you follow your passion, you will make money. You will probably make far more money than if you force yourself into a field because your friends tell you, oh, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, whatever. But if that's not really you, uh, don't listen to them. You listen to yourself. And, you're, and what happens with your passion is that you will be motivated to actually do more than the average person. So say you like dance uh, and you're thinking about professional dance, but everyone around you says, oh no, you've got to be kidding. You're not going to make any money. You won't be able to support yourself. You're blah, 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 blah. You know, um, but you love dance. Well, you know, I, so I just uh, put out a book called Thrive When Trouble Visits. And I interviewed uh, a whole bunch of people that were really successful in life. One of them is a professional dancer and he was from Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, and he grew up in a ghetto. They didn't have any money and it was a very macho kind of culture. And he, uh, and everyone said, don't, you know, you, boys don't dance. Um, so don't do that, you know? And his father was embarrassed that he would even think about doing it. Well, he, he kept at it and he would practice dancing on the rooftops of certain businesses where it was private and safe in the neighborhood he lived in, there was, it was sad to say there were guns and gangs and there was bullets he had to dodge and this and that it was really a very dramatic story. Um, and lo the long and short of it was he kept going. He became so good that the Boston ballet company uh, picked him as one of the best male ballet dance performers and he has all the money he could ever imagine but he's do, but he's not doing it for money it's it's for love and for passion so long answer to your question but that's uh that's what i'd say no that's that's a great answer and uh truth be told i took ballet as a kid and wow uh, and so and you he, mark here dr sullivan knows my brother so did both of my brothers. So uh, I wow. would go, go ahead and bring that up to my brother, Daniel. Uh, all right. Um, so the kids want to know, can you explain a little bit about the admissions process um, for students who are international students? Because yes. a lot of the kids here are looking to possibly come to college here in America. So what, how, what do they have to do for that? So there are many schools in the United States like Ohio State University, which is uh, the acronym is OSU, OSU for Ohio State University. And they, the reason they love international students is that they bring a lot, they bring really wonderful different ideas and perspectives because of your culture and your history. You look at the world different in some regards, and I say this not only with all due respect, but as a real positive. Because you're from, I understand some of you are from Italy, some are from Spain, some are from uh, you know, other countries. Sorry if I didn't mention your, your country, but um, you were raised with certain music and certain um, pra everyday practices that are, <clears throat> that has a unique culture. And many American universities are attracted 
to the fact that you can help blend and enrich the culture of their university. So that's a, a real plus. Now we'll also tell you it can be more expensive as an international student going to an American college. The pricing scheme, they have three different levels. They have um, a local in-state that's uh, within the 50 states of the United States. And then they have out of state, in country, and then they have out of country. And so guess which one is most expensive? <laughs> uh, so they, there's, to be honest, there's another reason why they're, they like international students is that um, they can charge more and they can make more money. But I will tell you overall, um, uh, the main reason is your, you know, what you bring personally that they're really attracted to. Um, but there are higher costs to handle, you know, make sure that we treat you appropriately and in the right way when you're coming in from another country so that you're comfortable and you enjoy and you get challenged and you're learning. Uh, but, you know, and there's a whole bunch of services that you get as an international student to help you along the way. What you do have to do up front, though, is show that you can speak uh, fluent, that you can speak, and that you can pass the fluent English uh, test. You probably know that already. Um, but anyway, what was the other part of your question, Ralph? Or that was, was that pretty it? much it. That was it because they were asking about that okay. process. So we'll do a couple more questions and we'll let you go. Um, so I put in the chat, uh, we have, and I'll put it in the video, the link for Mark's book, uh, Thrive uh, When Trouble Visits. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, also Ohio State University's um, website. You can uh, check that out. So one of the students emailed and they wanted to know, have you seen uh, technology have an influence on the way businesses run throughout your career? And where do you see it going from here on to the future? Uh, uh, it's a great question. And I, I'd say it's on hyperspeed, the pace of technology advancement. And, and that's both on the hardware and the software. Both are really... I would say the software is actually moving at a more accelerated pace, but um, especially with the power of AI, artificial intelligence, that is a very disruptive, in a positive way, it's a very disruptive force and going to change all different fields um, from industries such as education to, to uh, product companies, to service companies, to all sorts of companies. Uh, so if you're asking that because you're, thinking about technology and maybe having some role in that, um, you, you know, there are in most universities, at least in the United States, and, and they may have it differently organized in other countries, but they'll have the same idea, which is they'll have um, majors uh, that will focus around some element of technology. So engineering um, is really a, a absolutely critical area in technology and there's a lot of applications so you you're learning how to build products um, and how to provide a aftermarket service and sales cycle and so on uh, computer science is another major that is really obviously tied into technology there's uh, sales and marketing uh, major or like a marketing major that will focus uh, uh, in a little bit of an indirect way, but it, it's still very linked to technology in terms of what technologies are used to uh, for marketing. So of course we have social media uh, channels and devices uh, that are now used that will be combined with the kind of marketing principles. Um, so so that. I would like to, Ralph, um, I'd like to just mention a little something about how careers are, or you know, how industry uh, and careers are organized. Because I think that when you're in junior high or high school, if you're in seventh grade to 12th grade, you know, hopefully you're really focused on what do I love to study or to do? What do I actually, I dare say even have fun or enjoyment, um, you, you know, with a certain subject area. Well, that's 
uh, really helpful and that's what you wanna focus on. But there's also out there in terms of majors, um, ma uh, school majors in college uh, are often organized around how careers are played out in the marketplace. So it, uh, would that make sense for me to say a little something about that, Ralph? Yeah, absolutely. That, that fits uh, very well. Yeah. Um, so uh, we will, this will be the final question. This is coming from one of our students, Martina in Italy. And she wanted to know if you could speak to your younger self, knowing what goals you have achieved today, what would you say to your, your younger self? Oh, wow. What, what an incredible question. Um, well, so my younger self uh, wanted to be both important and a big shot. Uh, and I, I'm being honest now, okay? So I, I didn't know in what, but I just wanted to be a big shot, you know? And I wanted people to pay attention to me. And I wanted people to say, oh, wow, look at him, you know? Uh, it's like, oh, boy, you know, I, you know, I'm Mr. Big. Okay, so when I was in high school, that's that, I, you know, I didn't go around talking like that. I didn't say that to people, but that was my inside voice was saying, I want to be important and I want to be a big deal. Um, so fast forward some time, um, you know, I, I had to first be humble in a very sincere and genuine way, work hard listen to myself, but also listen to elders and listen to people with expertise as to um, some of the choices I was making around college subject areas and also level of effort and what I would work hard in. Um, and so what happened was um, I got really good at being able to do business in uh, on the people side of things. So I, I started selling insurance for Prudential Insurance. I was one of their best sales reps. And I made a little bit of money because I was really good. I enjoyed being able to listen and to kind of think through what were their unique needs and how to, how to match that to a product. Um, I was also a fundraiser. Uh, first for a nonprofit, uh, the Boy Scouts of America. And then I was a fundraiser uh, for other organizations. And, and um, you could see there was a theme around working with people as opposed to technology. But then, then um, I got into industry and um, started, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I got into sales for United Airlines and then I managed a sales institute. And uh, then I started to manage businesses. And I feel, I didn't realize I was becoming important, um, but I was kind of following a pat, my inner path of where my joy was and what I was good at, what I enjoyed. And, um, but I had to be humble and being able to listen to other people say, you know, you really screwed up, uh, you really uh, uh, made some mistakes today. And, and you really uh, need to do things better. And I had to, you know, be willing to listen to others and say, you know, I guess I don't have all the answers. Um, and um, that's part of my growing up. And I think that really helped when I had to make other decisions down mine. 